one of the things that makes all of this possible is that we stand on the efforts of the people who come before us. We stand on where they broke ground in technology or in training or in just being, well, just being the kings, let's say. It's my great pleasure to introduce John and Martha King. Hello, folks, and hello, good buddies. It's a whole bunch of good buddies. Now, you've probably figured this out by now, but I'm John King. And uh, Martha's over there getting her microphone on. One of the things I want to ask you, how many people in here are pilots? Please hold up your hands if you're a pilot. Almost all of us. The folks in here who are not pilots already know this. But folks, you people who are pilots are not normal. And the reason I say that is normal people don't do extraordinary things. And learning to fly is one of humankind's most inspiring achievements. When you learn to fly, it changes who you are and how you feel about yourself forever. For the rest of your life, part of the way you're going to define yourself is that you are a pilot. And the reason I say that you're not normal is that it takes an extraordinary commitment to learn to fly. There is a very large body of knowledge that you have to know to learn to fly. You have to have skills, you have to practice those skills, and during the time you're learning to fly, every single one of us at some point through there says, you know, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do this. Your right leg shakes, you sweat all the way down to your belt and beyond. And because flying self-selects people who are hardwired to complete what they start, you persist through emotional difficulties, stress, until you accomplish it. One time I was flight instructing, and my brother was meeting us. My brother is not a pilot, has no clue what motivates pilots. D doesn't think it's normal, it is not normal. But my student got out of the airplane and was dripping with sweat, completely covered with sweat. And my brother said to me, my goodness, was it hot in the airplane? And I thought, and I said, well, no, not particularly. And he says, well, why is he so completely covered with sweat? And I said, well, stress, I guess. And my brother said, if it causes him that much stress, why does he do it? And I still don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> but I know that every one of us in this room has been at one time or another, more than one time, covered with sweat in an airplane when it wasn't hot. But you persisted and completed what you did. Now, um, and so that means you're hardwired to accomplish things. Now, uh, I find that there are a lot of people in, in general aviation who like to say that flying is easy. Uh, personally, I find uh, flying well very difficult. People like to tease me, uh, our passengers, when Martha and I fly together, like to tease me that Martha makes consistently better landings than I do. I explain to them that landings aren't all that important. <laughs> <laughs> that it's risk management that counts. But I can tell you Martha's a better risk manager than I am, too. To me, flying does not come easy. It continues to take a tremendous amount of effort. So I congratulate this room full of people who put in that much effort. Now, I'm supposed to do the next slide too, aren't I? Well, you're uh, supposed to tell them who millennials all right, are. All right, we're supposed to talk about millennials. Um, there are a lot of definitions of millennials. And if you read books on it, you get all different ages. Uh, we kind of decided that millennials were born between 1980 and 2000. That would make them currently about 13 to 33 years old. But there's all different definitions of millennials. But it's interesting that in flying, not all of our customers are millennials. Flight Training, Mag Flight Training Magazine just did a, uh, a survey and they found out the average age of people coming into flight training is 50 years old. Um, in 2007, that age was 39. 
So for most of us in flight training right now, we're really not training millennials unless we're training young people who are starting off on a career. There haven't been too many of those lately, but it will increase because uh, United Airlines just called up the last of their uh, furloughed pilots and they're gonna be hiring new pilots. But up to now, we really haven't been training millennials. We probably will be in the future. But who are millennials? Well, millennials, like any other group, have large variances within the group. It's a big group in other areas of subgroups. And I'm gonna suggest one of those subgroups is people learning to fly. But it, it, you, can, you can define people all different ways. Only one way uh, is to define them as millennials. They have different parents, they have different economic backgrounds, and different educational motives and values. Um, for instance, it is said that people living in New York have more in common with people living in, in Paris than they do with people living in Nebraska. And that's probably true. And it's also true if they lived in Japan or in Tokyo. It's a, the big city people are living a different life than the rural people. So we've got all sorts of subgroups we could define. Um, so I think that the important subgroup that we're going to be training, all of us are in the training business, or nearly all of us, the important subgroup that we're going to be training is people who have decided that they want to learn to fly. And so that's really the key to it. Now, millennials do have, if they are millennials, they do have some things in common. They, they had parents driving them around in cars that said baby on board. I never fully understood that. Were, were babies more important than the rest of the people in the car? I don't, I don't know. I guess they were to the parents. And so those same parents became helicopter parents who were hovering over their lives. They were, millennials were highly supervised and, and over-programmed and, and sheltered. So uh, millennials kind of had this sense of being frustrated, dominated, confined. So based on, on that background for millennials and, and taking into effect the things that Don Marinelli was saying about them, what do millennials want? What do they, how do they behave? Well, they, they particularly, as Don said, they want meaning. They want significance in their lives. They're, they're community oriented and they want things to have significance. They collaborate with each other. They're connected. They're quick adopters of technology, very mobile, very social. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the only way to teach them and interact with them, but it means that there's opportunity there because they are so technologically adept. They grew up just thinking this was the normal way to go. They multitask a lot. They want, uh, they crave adventure. Flying is an adventure, as Don said, like no other, once we reach them and get them to understand what it is we have to offer. Millennials want the learning to be relevant to them. They're a case where you're not gonna be able to hand them a big, thick, heavy book and say, go, go read this and then come to class and we'll drill you on it. They're, they're going to want more fun, more engagement. Saying, do this because I said so, is not gonna resonate with them. They wanna know why, they wanna understand. As, as Don and Jeff said, they wanna be able to drill deeper and have more understanding. And they want learning to be full of variety so that they've got maybe shorter tasks with uh, moving from one to another in order to be more engaging. And they want it to be clear and simple. Above all, they want it to be fun. But. Here's an interesting thing we don't want to lose sight of, and that is that edutainment, fun edutainment as a way of teaching is not new with millennials. We've had it with us for a long, long time because everybody likes to be entertained while they're learning. And let me show you the oldest example that I could dig up of the fun edutainment that I used when I was growing up. Gene Autry 
teaching in his movies and his performances the cowboy code of conduct. You take care of women and children, you tell the truth, you're true to your word, so on and so on and so on. John is very amused, was very amused when, when we were dating, I told him that essentially I learned my moral code from the Western movies of the time. But that is edutainment that's been with us a long time. It may not surprise you, by the way, that Martha was a tomboy. Uh, when we were dating, one of the things we discovered is each of us had coonskin caps of the, <laughs> of the Davy Crockett era. I actually lost mine somewhere along the line. But, but it, as Don says and Jeff says, millennials are also gamers. Okay, we appear to have lost part of the... Well, we've got it's a there, reverse. it's just in red on black. Yeah, okay, so I, I'll, I'll read that to you so you've got uh, the information on that. The worldwide population of gamers is estimated at one billion. It's a lot of people. The U.S. population of gamers is estimated at about 170 million. And the percent of U.S. adults 18 to 34 who are defined or define themselves as gamers is about 60%. That's huge. And what it means is there's a lot going on in the world of gaming that we need to be aware of and take into consideration when we do flight training. By the way, just out of curiosity, how many people in here are gamers of any sort, ever played any kind of game at all? The majority. Now, I would have said no, then someone said, well, have you ever played solitaire on your computer? And the answer is probably we've all played some form of game. We had a friend um, that, that was, we knew him for a lot of different reasons. He was a billionaire. Uh, he created uh, cardiovascular catheters in, in his third bedroom of a three bedroom apartment. They were our mentors in business. And uh, as years went on, cardiovascular catheters were used for the then experimental procedure called angiograms. They became multi, multi-billionaires. They had 727s, all sorts of airplanes. But one day, he's working at his desk. I come around to see what he's doing, and he's playing solitaire on his computer. And I thought, holy mackerel, a billionaire has time. Maybe that's why he had time to play solitaire. <laughs> but g gaming uh, has revealed the power of well-crafted motivations. And we're, we think we're in the course design business, and I think what we all have to do, if we're teaching people, we have to understand those motivations and use them uh, and, and take advantage of them because they're very, very powerful. You take a look at the number of hours. People spend 20 and 30 hours a week involved in these computer games. A billion people. So we have to figure that out. And, and the most important thing I can say to you is when people are properly motivated, they can learn an enormous amount. Um, we, we all have, an, all of us, including millennials, have an enormous capacity to learn. Any normal child can learn one or more languages by the time they're two years old. By the t one or more, two or more, at least two, maybe more than that. But clearly, we can learn one or two languages by the time we're two years old. That's powerful motivation. And we can do it, and we have a tremendous capacity to learn, and it, it, it's, it's incredible. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many people in here have ever used a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone? Of course, everyone. We, it's not only millennials who have learned that stuff and know how to use that stuff. All of us have learned that. And we have a tremendous capacity to learn. And we're all using technology in a way that 20 years ago we would have never dreamed of. The idea of a personal computer is just incredible. And now we've got personal computers that, that, that could have sent people to the moon contained in our uh, iPads. So we, we've all learned this because we are very motivated to do that. Driving to the airport Monday, San Diego had a storm coming through on rare occasion. And I'm driving and as we're starting to pull into the airport, I said to John, check the radar, 
and see if there's any thunderstorms or is this stuff just light rain. So he pulls out his cell phone, he goes to my radar, he pulls up the picture, he sh holds it up in front of me and says, nothing more than very light rain. Five uh, years ago, 10 years ago, I mean, it's amazing. Our We're job, all of us, as educators, is to take advantage of this tremendous ability to learn and also of the power of games to help us do that. So games have an, an enormous amount of power to them. Uh, there are three concepts we'll talk about. First concept, I call them the three Fs. It's flow, fiero, and failure. So let's talk about how we who are in education can take advantage of those three concepts. Flow is, this, is the thing that keeps people in the games. It's this absolute absorption and concentration. It's intense and it's, it's, it's just kind of a, a really joyous engagement. They're completely involved in it, completely lack, lose track of time. Don't know where they are, what time it is. They're, they're working to their limits and they want to stay there. And that feeling is flow. And if we can do that when people are learning, we have done a wonderful, wonderful job. Now there are, as, as Jeff Van West was saying, there really are four elements of games that tend to promote flow. You have a clear goal, you have well-established rules, you have a feedback system. Uh, so it tells you whether you're achieving your goal, and of course it's all based on voluntary participation. All of us who are teaching people who are learning to fly are teaching people who are working on voluntary participation. Okay. So, uh, a good instructional program takes advantage of flow. And, and, they, and I'm having trouble reading it, so I'm going to step over here. Um, they do it with, um, it, you could use engaging computer-based instruction. Uh, you could have short video snippets. You're going to know where I'm going here in a minute. Um, you could have interaction through well-designed uh, quizzing uh, and immediate feedback. And of course, we at King Schools have, uh, have those in our instructional program. And let me, we talked about change. This, this, this whole session is about change. And, and I want to just kind of narrate the change that Martha and I have experienced. We started teaching two-day ground schools on a circuit, traveling around, teaching ground schools. And we, I remember one time I had 100 people in the class, and I was using a blackboard to teach the people. And then we went high-tech high and went to an overhead projector and a screen. Then someone said, you know, you should put these courses on video. And I said to them, you know, that just goes to show you don't know one damn thing about our business. Because <laughs> it won't work on video. Because it's the power of our dynamic personalities <laughs> that, that gets these results, and we wouldn't get these results on video. And so the guy said this, and about a year later he came back and he says, have you put it on video yet? And I said, I already told you, it's not going to work on video. And he says, I don't know how you know that unless you're going to try it. Uh, and so what we, we used to work late in the evening, and I would have a few students that held over, and I would teach commercial and flight instructor subjects with them. They, they were in with the privates, and then later on I would give them the additional information in the evening. So one time I put the, the video player up on a table and played the video and sat in the back of the room watching the guys watch me on video. And I felt very, very guilty about that because I was born Catholic and, and I get my guilt wholesale because my parents also had <laughs> so So I was feeling I wasn't working hard enough while these people were watching with me. And one guy lingered after, after class. He says, John, I want to talk to you. I saw it, I'll be delighted. And I knew he was going to come up with a criticism. And he said, you know, um, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything. But he said, you know, um, I kind of like the video better than when you were doing it in person. <laughs> I said, what? He says, I like the video better. And I says, why did you like the video better? He says, well, in person, you're obviously really tired. You're making a lot of mistakes. But on the video, apparently, you weren't that tired when you shot it because it didn't have those mistakes. And you're, these overhead projectors are the pits. He says, I can't read anything. But on the video, you zoomed in with the camera, and I could see everything we were doing. And so that was our clue to put everything on video. And then finally, we started selling the video. And we could take this two-day course that we had, put it in a box and ship it to people. And that moved the decimal point over in our business, and instead of teaching uh, 40,000 people a year, we were teaching tens of thousands of people per month. 
So it just, it just changed everything. And it was not really uh, being smart enough to recognize the technology. It hit us over the head. But then later on, computers came along. And so, and one of the problems with video is you couldn't see where you were. You could, there was no uh, place to tell how far along you were. You had, you had to rewind and look for things. But if you put it on a computer and you broke it into little tiny five minute segments, you could search, you could find out where you were, you'd go five minutes and then we would ask quizzing questions. At the end of the five minutes, you were more engaged. You'd watch for five minutes and then you'd prove that you knew the answers. And, and so all of this came gradually. But we've had to deal with change as it's gone along. And now, every course we have, with just very few exceptions, is available on the internet. We've got over 94 courses available on the internet. And so now you can be anywhere, any computer that's connected to the internet, you can take the course. And there's a huge body of knowledge and it makes learning a lot more fun, a lot more engaging with them. Uh, so I'll let Martha now try and recover because I've covered most of the stuff she was gonna say. <laughs> Well, based on the fact that we tried to make it clear, simple, and fun, and that that's the mantra around King Schools, uh, we've sold, we know we've sold over 700,000 knowledge courses, and with the pass along, particularly back in the video days, that's probably well over a million, and then millions of short subject courses. But and you might say, hold it, wait a minute, there's only 600,000 pilots in the United States. We've been doing this a while. Martha has, I'm just new to it. <laughs> but, but we've been doing it a while, and people come in and out of aviation. So we've been teaching a high percentage of them through the years they came in and out of, in, in and out of aviation. But what made it work? I think some of these principles. I think, we're, I think flow is built into our course. I, I think the point we're trying to make is that... What do you mean trying to make? <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. That... A well-designed course for a long time, any well-designed course, has tried as best it could with the given technology to incorporate these same gaming motivations, the same principles of flow that, that keep people engaged and keep them wanting to learn. Um, just a couple of examples on the main menu of our courses, we have a path they follow, but they can go anywhere. They don't have to follow it in order, although we recommend they do. They can jump anywhere they want. Uh, they get they, check marks when they, they complete. They get green and check marks and so Dates. on when they finish off a particular lesson. Uh, when they, like John says, short segments of video followed by quizzing, and the quizzing has fun answers with a, a green biplane that flows in and a nice pretty ding if they get it right, but a, a, a red uh, letter if they get a wrong answer and a boom that says, mmm, that's not good. So the, the whole idea is to let them track where they are, uh, benchmark, now they're not benchmarking against other people. So, you know, clearly there are some things that we might be able to do to incorporate uh, in course design to make it better. But trying, for instance, with this other version of the report card, they have both, to show them doing a trip across the country and how far are they based on how many of the questions they've taken and gotten correct. The whole idea is to try and give them a sense of playfulness. And Clearly, the ability to do this has changed for us already with the available technology and will change a lot more as the technology improves. In a sense, to follow up on what Jeff's concept is, these people are self-learning in a practical sort of way and they're in control of their own learning. And that's the whole principle that I think that uh, Redbird is going to expand on. Now we talked about the three F's. The second F is Fiero. And that is just a tri triumphant excitement when you've accomplished something very, you're exhilarated. And here is a great example of uh, Fiero. Uh, this is a Redbird student who just sold. And, and it's written all over him. He's having his Fiero moment. And that's what happens when you accomplish something tremendously difficult. Now the third F is failure. 
And um, to, to put failure in context, if you go to a carnival uh, and start playing games in a carnival, one of the things that they'll have is a basketball and a basketball hoop. And you shoot at the basketball hoop. Now the trick is, the hoop is just enough smaller that the basketball wants to bounce out of it no matter how well you shoot. You have to do a perfect shot to get it in there. But it looks like any basketball hoop, and it looks like you ought to be able to do it very easily. And so what happens is these guys that are really great at basketball, let me show you, I'll do this, and they miss, and they miss, and they miss, and it keeps them in the game. If they won, they'd say, I'll show you, I showed you, and they walk off to another game. Failure keeps them in the game. So one of the points of gaming is that you don't want people to have a quick success because that ends the game. The whole idea, it's like playing 21 at a casino. We'll put, uh, I, we used to put $20 down, it wouldn't last long. And what we were doing is trying to prolong the game until we ran out of our money playing 21 at a casino. And, and so that's what a carnival is all about, is to keep you playing so you spend the maximum amount of money possible. And it's also what gaming is all about. That's why people spend 22 and 30 hours on these games, because the gaming is designed to keep them them involved in the game and they if they they really don't want to win the game because if they completely win the game the game is over it ends the game so our concern is that may not we need to be careful when we're taking teaching people and designing courses about this issue of failure because as I said earlier for many of us especially me flying well is difficult and failure comes as a part of flying. I have never, ever done a trip where I said, well, that one was perfect. I could always look back to see something I could have done uh, differently or better. Uh, so failure in flying can be, can be demotivating, and it also may not be efficient. We, we, we want to help people uh, learn efficiently. You know, early pilots, learn to fly by trial and error. Obviously, the Wright brothers didn't have any flight instructor waiting around for them. And we taught pilots in Alaska all the time who lived out in a bush community, and somebody would sell them a tail dragger, take them around the pattern, and the guy would actually learn by trial and error. Now, the problem with learning by trial and error, and you can still learn that way, it's not very efficient. It takes a lot longer, and it's dangerous, and, and it, it, can be, it, it can be frustrating. So you can learn by trial and error, but I think part of our job is to give people as much guidance as we can and help them so that, that they're not experiencing unnecessary failure. Basically, to make sure that they have the big picture so that they know where everything fits and, and where everything goes, uh, so that they can make sense out of stuff from the beginning. Now, game design principles work very well, in our opinion, in flight training in um, a, a number of circumstances. They particularly are going to work well when repetition is what's needed. Um, repetition to get a physical skill down, repetition where you have to do rote memorization about uh, some regulations or, or some things about airspace, because what they do is they get rid of the tedium of drill, which is a tedium for everyone. And if you can turn that into a game, it's a fabulous way to do it. And for instance, the Redbird Trainer. How many people in here have flown the Redbird Crosswind Trainer? The, the crosswind okay, trainer. The crosswind trainer. Redbird took a previously very boring product, which was basically a, a mechanism to, that you could fly to, to see if you could uh, get, keep it lined up on the runway with basically a, a carpet with a yellow stripe on it as being your runway. And they took that product and really put fabulous visuals with it, put a computer with it, put a scoring system with it, and now what you've got is a, a, a system, the crosswind trainer, that when you fly, it scores you as far as how you're doing when you touch down on that runway, how good your crosswind landing is. And because it's scoring you, and because they're tracking it like they are on the, um, 
the text messaging questions that they're doing here, and like they're doing on the uh, adventures, at the scenarios in there for the 45 degree turns, you put your name in and it will rank you at that flight school as to how you're doing. So you can look and see, oh, Joe over there, he's got an 830 and I only got 795. Hmm, I wonder how much practice I'll have to do in order to beat his score. It's turned it into a competition, a game, and that makes people want to keep working at it, keep trying at it. The same thing with the FMX. When game design principles really work well is, again, when you're teaching risk management and decision making. The scenarios that you can set up in an FMX where the weather gradually comes down and you watch the, the customer, the student, try and work their way through, well, what am I going to do when the visibility gets to this point and the visuals are good enough, it can really put them in a decision-making risk management situation. That's absolutely fantastic. And, and uh, they're, they're just fabulous for that, as well as the, the physical practice on learning to fly. Now, we're going to do a little bit of a contrarian opinion or maybe add something to it. Um, do you remember who warned us to be careful of irrational exuberance? Do you remember who that was? So, come on, who was? Holler it out. Greenspan. Alan Greenspan. 1996 in December, he warned us about the dot com, basically. The dot comers were, would come to us. We were, in a, we were doing direct marketing at the time. We're still doing direct marketing. The dot comers would come to us and say, you know what? The world has changed. The rules are all over. You should get rid of all your bricks and mortar because anybody that's investing in bricks and mortar is going to fail. You have to be completely uh, over the dot com world. And to some extent, they were right because any business now has to have a website. But we don't get rid of our bricks and mortar. And so the dot com busted. Uh, he made this warning about irrational exuberance in December of 1906. The next month, the stock market, uh, market fell out of it, uh, just completely crashed, and the dot-comers were virtually out of business if that's all they had. There are a few dot-coms left, for instance, Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, who have done extremely well, but the, most of them went down. And so uh, I, I don't want to say that reality is broken. Flying is the ultimate reality. And we just read a book that uh, was really a good book saying uh, reality is broken. But what we do need to do is learn from the motivations of gaming and tie them together. Uh, our feeling is uh, that, the, that you can learn. Flight safety uh, trains people to fly a 7X completely without ground school. 7X is Falcon's, uh, and now not their second newest airplane, and it's a fly-by-wire airplane, and the 7X has, in the airplane, big computer screens. So if you turn on a fuel pump, you'll see on the screen the electric pump going, the valves opening, the fuel pressure changing, and so on. And so therefore, when you learn to fly a 7X, you never have a systems course. You just start a flight, and you, they, they call it operational day flow. You go from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, and you fly trips in the airplane. And as you fly those trips in the airplane, you turn on the electrical system, and you see the, the diodes uh, uh, closing, and you see the electricity flowing, and you see the voltages all the way throughout. You learn the systems in use as you do them day by day. And they, and, but that is a three-week course, and they're only learning to fly that airplane, uh, and the systems for that airplane. They're not learning to fly everything about aerodynamics, weight and balance, uh, and all of those other things. And my feeling is that, that it, it will really work to learn the application of flying in an airplane. But since we're in a ground school business, I'm going to tell you that there are some things that you can learn much more efficiently by taking a course like ours that puts you uh, in control of your learning, but much more efficiently learning the, the big picture. So you get the big picture before you start applying it in a simulator or in an airplane. So we're going to suggest there's a wonderful combination that already exists, and, and that is uh, using King Schools that gives you the big picture very efficiently, and then Redbird. 
And I think Redbird lets you apply those schools, skills in an unprecedented sort of way. So we're making our argument, Jerry, for, for keeping the King Schools type of overall knowledge around because that's very, very efficient way of learning things and having the applications be in the simulators and the airplanes. Folks, that's enough of argument from us. Thank you very much. <laughs>